thanks for coming. Uh, I hope you enjoy the break. Uh, also, uh, thanks organizer for giving me the opportunity to talk here. So uh, by secrets, I meant uh, some of the valuable things uh, I found to be useful during my research, and I want to share those uh, things uh, with you. Because uh, uh, usually, uh, if you look into the media or may maybe just machine learning, um, like the textbook, sometimes those things are not so obvious. So I just uh, collect many of the information together. And uh, many of the things I'm going to talk about is actually drawing from one of the uh, spring school we had in May. Um, many of the materials, including source code, lecture notes, uh, exercise, and some challenges, you can search SSS on GitHub to get all the uh, stuff. So don't worry, the, 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 those materials, they are in English. So only the uh, poster was uh, in Chinese that was trying to attract students. You can see it has the deep learning, tensor networks, and uh, Julia programming language, and the uh, quantum uh, software, quantum algorithms. So I will draw uh, lots of material from this part, deep learning. And uh, that's the actual collaborative effort. Uh, my collaborator, Pan Zhang, from Institute of Theoretical Physics. Hai Jun is my colleague from IOP, and uh, Jingbo is my postdoc. And Xiu uh, Zhe was uh, a visiting student. Now uh, he's uh, in Waterloo and the uh, Permanent Institute. They helped me prepare lots of materials. And uh, uh, those are uh, like entrance level uh, textbooks. So this one, so called Master Algorithms, is a popular book. So it's easy to read uh, on a train, um, on a flight. So it's very light. But uh, it has an overview for machine learning. So those two are more serious textbooks. So. Uh, uh, Christopher Bishop, uh, he was actually uh, trained as a high energy physicist. Now he's a director of uh, uh, Microsoft Research in Cambridge. So uh, this book is called the Pattern Recognition and Machine Learning. It's a quite a famous book before deep learning, but it has a, it covers many of the um, fundamental uh, principles about the learning and so on. So this is a more recent book, deep learning. It contains so-called modern topics. But uh, since the field is rapidly uh, evolving, so even after three years, there are so many new progresses. Uh, by the way, on those topics, uh, uh, actually there are many, many excellent online courses. We collected some of the links. Uh, you can check later. Um, I also want to re uh, recommend some old books. So this one is called Perception, written by Marvin Minsky and uh, uh, Packard. So lo those was like really, uh, very old. Um, one of the first paper on uh, one of the first uh, book on this topic, and uh, uh, you see this is a very artistic drawing about what is the neural network uh, doing, and uh, uh, this is like more than like 50, 50 years, forty years old. And uh, uh, I recommend it because uh, back in those days uh, the computers were not uh, uh, powerful enough. So they, uh, those pioneers really uh, like think uh, hard and uh, uh, do lots of pen and, pen, uh, pen and uh, paper work. For example, you see on page six of that book, uh, the authors were considering some decision problems. So uh, whether this is a circle or not circle, this uh, binary classification problem, they were considering uh, what is the ability of this kind of uh, uh, neural network for those problems, uh, whether this is convex or not, whether this is connected or not. So uh, those those ones you can uh, say it's not uh, that easy for human. That's why they got uh, those two pictures on the image, right? Which one is connected? So basically, th this book contains uh, uh, many of the those kind of toy problems, and uh, uh, the uh, authors try to uh, prove some kind of theorems to show the ability and the disab uh, disability uh, of uh, uh, deep neural networks. And uh, nowadays, uh, when deep learning was so popular, sometimes people consider this book uh, as uh, uh, too, too conservative because uh, uh, they were already claiming many of the uh, limitation of neural networks. But I think uh, from, for, from our perspective as a physicist, if we really want to understand those things, 
and trying to uh, make a solid and a rigorous progress. Those are uh, highly recommended books. So another one that's from 80s, uh, you, can, you can also see uh, contains many of those, this is called TC problem, uh, many of those, uh, I would say, uh, interesting uh, toy examples help us to build intuitions and understandings. So that, that's another uh, book. Uh, uh, I, I like it because uh, you see, that's from uh, 1998. That's a conference uh, uh, proceeding. So uh, the conference is called Scientific Applications of Neural Network. So you might have heard that there were uh, up and downs in the research of the neural network and deep learning. So uh, 1998 was uh, between two of the peaks of those uh, fields. So I like this paragraph. Uh, because uh, it, you, you can say uh, it, it was trying to summarize or doing some reflection about what happened uh, in the previous uh, hype. Uh, you see, uh, even in mid 80s, uh, the thing re emerged on the scene as a kind of new uh, way of doing science and so on. Um, but uh, uh, somehow uh, it didn't uh, last uh, for so long, and those authors were saying uh, probably that's because uh, some of the authors were too enthusiastic and not sufficiently critical, and sometimes people oversell the ability of their approach. So um, I think that's a, just on a caution note. Uh, even even nowadays, I guess we need to be uh, very careful about the, those uh, hacks, right? So that, that's why I, I, I want to ask those questions. So why after like 20 years, we are doing this again? Why again, right? What has changed, what has not? So because uh, if we want to, we decide to uh, do it again using lo those uh, fancy techniques for scientific application, we need to kind of pick up recent progress and uh, uh, not just repeat history, right? So uh, by, by those things, I, I meant the secret. And uh, you might guess what, what, what would be the secret. So we have uh, any idea, suggestion? So, uh, you see, many people talk about the GPUs, uh, computers, or data. I think that's an important fact. But uh, since everyone is talking, that, talking about that, that's not a secret, right? So uh, what I found to be particularly uh, important are those two things. I summarize them as the key technology and core ideas. So the key technology, I think, behind many of those successful was uh, differentiable programming. So I just uh, arranged uh, this uh, uh, tutorial in this form, so I will talk them uh, sequence. So, uh, have you already uh, talked about uh, uh, differential programming and applications to tensor, tensor networks? I might repeat some of the uh, basic things. I think for understanding uh, repetition uh, is sometimes useful. But I will try to do that from different perspective. So, uh, I would say differential programming is the engine of the deep learning. So, uh, you see that people uh, train a deep neural network to classification or to uh, uh, generalization, uh, generation modeling. So the, I would say the, the core idea, the core component behind it is actually to compose many of the differentiable uh, components to a, to a program. Okay, and uh, then they just then, but this program has uh, many uh, adjustable adjustable uh, parameters. Then they try to uh, train this program or tune this these parameters uh, in an end-to-end -end fashion. And uh, uh, in some of the applications, this program happen, happens to be a neural network. And uh, uh, those training is called differentiable because usually they make use of the, the gradient. Later, I'm going to show you different uh, optimization uh, uh, schemes. But uh, usually, they really like to take gradient of the program and uh, uh, turns out to be very useful. Uh, and uh, because of the success, nowadays, you can uh, even say, uh, some uh, uh, machine learning paper that uh, they uh, make non-differentiable stuff differentiable only because they want to take gradient. There are so many uh, those kind of uh, tricks. Later I'm going to show you why, why gradient is so, so useful. So um, if we abstract many of those neural network biological stuff away, then uh, the, at the heart of this uh, stuff is so-called competition graph. So you can view a neural network our program as a competition graph. So that's a kind of abstract way to express the competition process. So those arrows, they just uh, 
indicate how, how is the dependence of your kind of a data to, to the next stage of data until you have an output. So for the case of that uh, feed for the neural network, the, the graph behind it, I call it a comb graph because it, it looks like a comb. So those are the data, imagine uh, those images. Those are the parameters, the weights, biases of your uh, neural network. But uh, in each step, you just combine those information to get some uh, next step of data. Then you do the next layer and, and until you, you got the scalar value loss function. And uh, uh, to, the, the goal is to compute the uh, gradient of loss function with respect to those two guys. And uh, uh, let me just formalize it, uh, because later it's going to be useful, uh, by defining so-called a joint variable. So a joint is, has this funny notation. So if there's a variable, I just put an over, over line above. So a joint means the gradient of the final loss with respect to this data. Then by definition, uh, loss function is a scalar function. So the joint of loss function is one. So now the goal is very simple. So after I already run the network, so in the end, I have, I have a joint uh, in the end. Now the goal is to somehow uh, uh, pull back this information uh, backwards in the graph until I got a joint of these two guys. So that, that, that's the goal of uh, so-called back propagation. And uh, the way to do it is that uh, in each step, you just uh, revert the uh, function evaluation direction, and uh, locally you just uh, multiply the joint uh, with the local Jacobian. Then you can propagate this joint back on this graph. So you just, in each step, you just revert the arrow until you reach the end. So that, that's so-called <coughs> back propagation. And uh, uh, you, you see that uh, uh, it's uh, efficient in a sense, uh, you just uh, revert, uh, tra tra transfer the graph backwards, then you compute uh, the gradient with respect to all the parameters. So if you want, you even com can compute the gradient with respect to the input data. Sometimes people do that uh, in, a, in a single pass. So, so, so can you remind us that you're taking the gradient with respect to these theta variables? Yes. So. Uh, when you say L bar, it's DL by D theta. Uh, error bar, by if, you, if you put the definition here, so L bar is actually partial error, partial error, that it has to be one. And what we need is a theta bar. Theta, theta bar. Theta bar is partial error, partial theta. Oh, so the derivative is always back to L. Exactly. So what, what you had is always error on the nomi uh, no, uh, nominator. And uh, the thing you, you had is in the denominator. So that's uh, the uh, definition of a joint. So, so, just so you want to calculate theta one bar? Exactly, exactly, exactly. Right. What we had was the error bar. So how, how, how should we get this back? Okay. Yeah. And uh, um, the combination graph can be much more general than this uh, comb graph. In general, can, it can be a so-called directed acyclic graph, meaning uh, it's just a, like a program because there's no, no, no cycle. So, so th then, um, what uh, uh, we got uh, for this uh, adjoint back propagation is uh, essentially a message passing algorithms. So meaning that, uh, you see, in the end, we know the adjoint of uh, the, 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 the loss function. Then, then we just follow this rule that uh, locally each of the variable uh, can collect the adjoint information from its child. So, so like this one, or maybe if you want here, I want to collect the joint information of x2 and x3. Then I just uh, um, collect this information to compute uh, <coughs> my, my information locally. Now, once I collect all the uh, joint, I can pass on to my parent. So it's uh, just uh, passing from the leaf nodes to the root nodes. So in, in this way, you define uh, this back propagation uh, on a general uh, graph. and. Uh, uh, there are so many advantages. Have, had you already talked about it? And uh, uh, not surprisingly, there were many uh, or, uh, scientific applications even like before uh, the deep learning age, I would say. So that's uh, one of the pioneers by Sanjay Sorella. Uh, he computed the force in an AB initial Monte Carlo uh, calculation. Um, and uh, that's for quantum optimal control because you, had, you can apply a bunch of unitaries to a quantum state. And the goal was to um, penalizing the uh, 
finite state uh, fidelity and so on. And uh, that's from chemistry literature. Uh, so this is called so-called fully variational hydrofolk. Because usually when people do hydrofolk in chemistry, they just uh, get uh, a bunch of uh, so-called basis functions. For example, uh, uh, Slater uh, Gaussian orbitals, meaning they uh, collect a bunch of Gaussians to mimic Slater uh, orbital. But uh, usually uh, those uh, uh, orbitals, all those basis functions were predetermined. So some people just optimize one atom and so on to just uh, pe every people agree on, on one set of uh, uh, basis. Then what the uh, Hartree-Fock optimizes was the uh, expansion coefficient on those basis. But uh, those are fully variational Hartree-Fock means uh, uh, um, they even want to optimize uh, the parameter parameters in the basis function like the width of the Gaussian and the combination they call it contraction uh, coefficient in the in the Gaussian. So that's why they can push down the Hartree-Fock energy even further. Um, conventionally, this was not easy because uh, you can say Hartree-Fock has a self-consistency look loop, and uh, what those people do was essentially to uh, differentiate this through Hartree-Fock self-consistency calculation until they reach the gradient with respect to the parameters in the basis, and. Uh, um, actually to have a, I would say, a good understand, a good, uh, to, to really make a, a good use of uh, automatic differentiation in this trick, uh, I think one needs to uh, have a um, good, uh, deeper understanding about the, the, those tricks. So um, going beyond the thing that automatic differentiation is just a black box that takes gradient of the program for you. or um, Sometimes you also hear that people were saying that uh, AD is just applying chain rule uh, automatically. So lo lo those understandings they are uh, correct, but I would say they miss uh, some of the fun parts or the interesting um, uh, components. Uh, from this problem, you can see that um, that's actually from Google Jack's uh, documentation. You see that uh, um, you can even have the so-called functional programming or differential geometry uh, perspective to AD. So in the next few slides, I just uh, uh, give you um, some flavor about uh, those uh, understandings. I want to convince you those understandings indeed help uh, make help us make good use of AD. And uh, um, so uh, let me first define some basic uh, uh, notations. So so uh, uh, as you can see that uh, for um, um, let's say one-dimensional chain graph, computation graph. AD basically means uh, uh, applying chain rule. So uh, the graph behind this equation is very simple. It's just one, even simpler than that chain graph. But then already you see some uh, different uh, choices because uh, okay. uh, what uh, I've been uh, uh, telling you um, for this uh, Back propagation uh, essentially means uh, you multiply all those Jacobians from left to the right, and because you, you start you start from um, the output from the end of the, the graph and multiply in this way. So, in in this case, um, the the back propagation direction is uh, reverse uh, with respect to the forward path. So that that's why uh, we need to store many of the intermediate uh, result and. Uh, uh, computationally, each step, what we did was essentially something called a vector Jacobian product. Uh, because usually we write a Jacobian uh, matrix here uh, in the form of output dimension times the input dimension. So in, if you multiply in this way, you are multiplying the vector from the, uh, from, from the left. And uh, um, like we learned for, from basic linear algebra uh, for, for this kind of expression, whether you multiply from left to the right or from right to the left really make a difference uh, in the computational complexity, right? Because if R is a scalar value, this is a like, small end of, of the, the matrix. They are always doing uh, vector matrix. If, if you do it this way, it's less efficient, even though you, get, you are computing the same thing. So that's the reason why for um, typical machine learning purpose or even for uh, rational calculation purpose, we are always doing this so-called reverse mode 
reverse model automatic differentiation. We pay the price for the storage, but uh, uh, we since we since we had a scalar value uh, uh, loss function. So not surprisingly, there's uh, another way of doing that. This is called a forward mode. There's no storage overhead, but uh, uh, this was usually not useful for um, function with a scalar uh, output. People use that for computing higher order gradient, like Hessian and so on. And uh, um, you can imagine for a more general graph, so uh, it's then not a good idea to express them in, in equations, but it's better to just draw the graph. Then there are then many different <coughs> ways uh, of uh, uh, passing those uh, uh, joint information. That's so-called uh, mixed mode, because you really want to uh, make use of the uh, topological structure of the graph to save memory and save the computation time. And uh, the other uh, uh, crucial thing is, uh, now here I just expand everything out, you see Jacobian times Jacobian, but uh, um, um, I think sometimes it's also good if you combine, for example, two steps into one step, because if you multiply this thing out, that's another Jacobian. So uh, in some cases, uh, it's good to, uh, for example, control the so-called uh, granularity because you can view um, the computation graph in a different uh, scale. So the, for, for each of the so-called primitives, it can be an intrinsic math function, sine, cosine, square root. Or it can be a combination of many steps uh, into, for example, a linear algebra operation. Or it can be some customized uh, Especially for your program, it can be, for example, um, self-consistency calculation of the hydrophobic entail convergence. Because as long as you can compute the uh, vector Jacobian backpropagation rule, uh, you are free to define your own uh, primitives. So th those are the, to me, are the fun parts of uh, AD because uh, you really integrate uh, the um, backpropagation uh, um, program design with your domain specific uh, uh, application. So uh, there are many benefits of just writing your own primitives. And uh, uh, there are so many. For, for example, uh, th those ones I think are quite important for our scientific application. So imagine you had some ancient um, uh, library, linear algebra library, like BLAS or LAPAC. That was written in Fortran. Many years ago, without caring about uh, automatic differentiation, but now somehow I want to use that as uh, one component of my uh, differentiable program. What should I do? So uh, the the thing is that we do not have to uh, take gradient inside those ancient Fortran library, because as long as you know what uh, those program is doing, so as long as you can uh, figure out what is the Jacobian what the Jacobian product of that program. You can, you can supply your own uh, backpropagation function and uh, um, just uh, embed those library into the whole differentiable program. And uh, those can even go into uh, like crazy directions. For example, this is called Paninan. It's a library uh, by uh, Shenandu, that's a quantum computing uh, company in Canada. Uh, we were even considering a hybrid classical and uh, quantum uh, Computation graph, so some of the node goes to a quantum hardware. Uh, but this doesn't matter. As long as you can kind of get the gradient, you can mix everything. So for them, the goal was really make this as a, like TensorFlow for quantum computing uh, software. So it can mimic uh, do, doing simulation or maybe later just uh, to ho hook up some of the uh, quantum processors. And uh, uh, like Hydrin showed, this, I think this is a very pa pedagogical example. Also one of the first uh, uh, kind of a, a working library uh, for, for, for automatic differentiation. So it's very uh, nice if you look into implementations of many of the uh, uh, functions. And uh, uh, another thing is uh, uh, loop condition and sort permutation. Many of those uh, 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 operators they are also differentiable. So it looks like those things should not be differentiable. So now, now the thing is, uh, uh, imagine you had a, for example, if um, statement in the program. So what happened for, for those uh, computation graphs is, uh, it's a so-called dynamic graph. So uh, at the runtime, um, once, you, once you fix the input data, 
uh, you have to go through one of the if statement. So that means when you want to take gradient uh, uh, to your program with the if uh, statement. So uh, for, for, for different input, the graph might have different uh, uh, topological structure. So it uh, changes from time to time. When I, when I was talking about taking gradient to a graph, so it's, uh, in, it's in the sense of dynamical, uh, dynamic, dynamical computation graph. And uh, uh, that, that's many of those uh, packages. Uh, those are the things we were using uh, for our research. And uh, uh, Hadrian showed uh, this table in his talk. That was the current status of many of those uh, libraries. And uh, some of those are buggy. But it, in any case, those libraries are faster developing. So um, uh, I think uh, maybe if you check next month, it's going to be uh, different. And also, uh, I think as a user, we can also contribute trying to uh, fix uh, the bugs and do, do PR for, for those libraries. Uh, Jingguo, so my poster had a blog poster where he put uh, many uh, of the kind of discussions and derivations uh, related to how, how, should, how should we fix, uh, for example, uh, complex value of SVD uh, in certain language and so on. And, and you see also because that uh, at the moment, uh, there, there is no single framework that allows us to do everything. So uh, Jingguo is mentoring Andreas Peter, that is a student uh, in uh, Glasgow, uh, doing this GSOC, Google Summer Code project, uh, because they are uh, Julians, so they like Julia. So they, for them, the, the goal was to um, write a uh, um, Julia version um, of uh, all those uh, uh, automated feature libraries to bring this to Julia community. The idea is to support everything. And, uh, so um, you, what do you mean by that the block doesn't have a linear? Oh, so you don't have that auto differentiation for a linear so, 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 so li since the linear art, I, mean, I, I basically mean this uh, LaPack level, because uh, if it's plus, like uh, matrix, matrix, matrix vector, so those are uh, almost trivial to support. But by this linear ARG, I really, really mean like uh, eigensolver and uh, SVD and so on. So uh, at, uh, at, at the moment, for example, Flux and Auto, they do not have a kind of official support for those operators, but uh, they are writing many of those things, yeah, yes, um, yes, and uh, uh, so, so you might notice this uh, Zagoto because uh, those are related to the libraries because uh, actually these things have different uh, kind of uh, perspective, like stat static, dynamic, or different mechanism for, for doing, uh, doing automatic differentiation. So this Julia library Zagoto has an interesting way of doing uh, source to source translation. So uh, I think uh, for them, uh, they, are, they are, I think, among the first to uh, realize that uh, um, deep learning, or machine learning, and scientific program, scientific computing share lots of the facilities and, uh, um, and uh, techniques. So uh, that's uh, the quite recent paper uh, announcing kind of a, an updated version of Zagoto. Uh, they, in the paper, they showed many of the examples. You see that uh, it spans uh, uh, a very broad uh, kind of a field, right? Machine learning ideas, financials, and quantum circuit differential equations. So uh, I encourage you to uh, look into those, uh, um, those papers. And uh, an another paper I want to, so that's actually a technical report. It was not uh, actually published, but you can find it online. That there were other notes and papers because it's quite technical, <coughs> anyway, it's useful. So it's a collection of many of the matrix derivative results. So you see there are many of those uh, 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 plus level thing. That was easy. But then there was some determinant in inverse matrix exponential and uh, all kinds of uh, um, matrix factorization uh, uh, um, of uh, automatic differentiation. So I can show the list. Uh, uh, if you really want to go into this business, those are nice uh, resources that you can uh, check. So, um, with, with all those uh, uh, information, I think, uh, at least to my understanding, I think uh, it, we are really 
kind of ready for writing differentiable scientific uh, software because you see those things are, by the way, all the ordinary differential uh, equation integrators, uh, they are also differentiable with a constant memory uh, usage. Uh, people already build up a differentiable ray tracer and a differentiable uh, fluid simulations. I can imagine in the future uh, many of those things will become um, uh, possible and uh, uh, available. So uh, let, me, let me show you some concrete examples. So um, this is so-called differentiable eigensolver. So you see that uh, the, imagine this step is like one step in the long computation graph. So for the input I had my Hamiltonian, that is the Hermitian matrix. And uh, then I got my wave function and my uh, uh, eigenstate. So um, I told you about the two modes for doing automatic differentiation. So the four mode mode is actually something we're quite familiar with. Because essentially that was asking the question, what, what's, it, what's going to happen if I change the input Hamiltonian a little bit? So this is nothing but the perturbation theory. Actually, first of all, the perturbation theory. So if you look into the, uh, if you look into the nodes about forward mode AD, the gradient is identical to perturbation theory. First of all, the perturbation theory we learned from quantum mechanics. So that's not new to us. And uh, this reverse mode AD, then is asking a more interesting question. Uh, imagine uh, you take uh, this psi and the lambda as an uh, outcome for this computation step. Then you do some downstream calculation. Imagine you had some uh, objective function that depends on the energy gap, maybe. Or maybe you, you want to design your state. Then, then, then the question to ask is, uh, uh, suppose I had the, this is, this two are actually a joint. If I had a joint for those two output, what should I do to my Hamiltonian? So uh, I can bring down my uh, objective function. So this is the question that reverse mode AD uh, is asking. I call this inverse perturbation theory. So not surprisingly, they had a strong connection. But anyway, it's a, it's a, it's a different way to uh, view those uh, quite familiar and old topics. And, uh, for sure, those can be used for doing Hamiltonian engineering because you can engineer your Hamiltonian matrix element so you achieve a certain goal. So uh, I had some online examples, but also uh, that was a paper actually from here. So Oshikawa Sensei and his student uh, tried to, um, so they were, they were, they were not uh, using this language. They were using Feynman Hamilton theorem and so on. And uh, they were, their goal was to, uh, to, to learn from data to get some kind of a effective Hamiltonian. But, but essentially, if you formulate what they did in this language, it's, it's the same thing. And also, in their case, their loss function only depends on the uh, energy spectrum. So that, therefore, those uh, equations become, become uh, simpler. But let, let me show you a demo uh, also along this line. So I call it this inverse, inverse shooting a solver. So I'm giving you this, this like one dimensional <laughs> Example, the so one-dimensional continuous space shooting equation. So kinetic energy, potential energy. So uh, now, now, now um, I think we're quite, we're quite familiar. <laughs> if we had this potential, we can solve the state. But now I want to ask the reverse question. So I'm, I'm assuming that uh, I will have some target ground state density distribution. I can draw some arbitrary shape, like, like a house, like a triangle, and so on. Then I ask, what, what, what should be the, the, the potential energy for me to get that ground state? <coughs> so, and uh, how should we solve that, that, that problem, right? So, um, uh, I can show you some code, and I can write on time. But, by the way, all those things can be found uh, online in this uh, Git, GitHub rep, uh, repo. So, so that, that's uh, the code for, for doing that. Uh, and by the way, to, to solve this, we can use a very simple like uh, discretization. I just uh, write the whole thing as a uh, uh, sparse matrix. So that's the uh, uh, off-diagonal uh, Laplacian. That's a diagonal thing, so I can diagonalize it. So, so basically, um, that's, that's the code. So that was like one-dimensional shooting a solver, which has diagonalized the Hamiltonian. So build the Hamiltonian and solve it. And uh, the loss function um, is in the so-called forward mode. I solve it, and I compute the, uh, the ground state 
and uh, overlap with some packet state. So this is basically defining the fidelity. And then there's a loss function. Loss function is one minus that guy because I want to minimize loss function. My loss function is infidelity. And uh, the, 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 all the, all the, the learnable parameters are the potentials on those grid. And uh, you can optimize that using uh, from optimizer, from PyTorch. So if you, if you write, um, so, so you will see what, what, what's happening here is uh, uh, this, uh, this, uh, red, uh, this blue curve is a target density. I, I wish my ground state has, looks like that. And uh, um, this green thing is the learned potential. So you see, we have to have this like uh, strange looking potential such that uh, my ground state uh, uh, density f uh, fits this blue thing. So it's not perfect. You still see a lot of oscillations. That's because my target uh, is discontinuous. So it's, it's not so easy. But, uh, but anyway, you, that's uh, a way of doing that. You can imagine more complex. And more interesting examples. Is, is this a result of a conjugate gradient type uh, uh, optimization or something else? The optimization? Yes. For, for the optimization, uh, what I'm doing is uh, BFGS, that's a Corsair Newton. Corsair uh, Newton. Yeah, uh, optimizer. But, but, uh, but uh, since this example is uh, easier enough, I think uh, uh, almost uh, we can uh, try. Maybe we can try something else. I think should should also work. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think uh, that, that's also a good point of playing around with. Okay, it didn't work. <laughs> yeah. I think RBFJS is uh, better, right? Maybe learning with. Uh, yeah, let's play with that later. Anyway, so so you see with a single line you can change the optimizers, and um, so those are some uh, exercises we can think about. Um, oh, you see, from, from the code, uh, actually I was used doing a very stupid thing because uh, I built this uh, huge matrix because I have such a fine mesh. Then I diagonalize the whole matrix and only picking the ground state. So that's definitely not efficient because uh, what, what we care about in that was the ground state. And uh, uh, what if we only solve for the lowest uh, energy state using the power method of Langtrus? So in, in, in this case, I'm not using the eigensolver, right? Because uh, in, in this reference I was talking about, it was uh, for those ordinary eigensolver. Then uh, the question is, uh, uh, what should we do if we use the iterative uh, solver, where we only get one state? How should we do the back propagation? Then that's an interesting problem, because usually for quantum physics problem, usually we, we are always doing lamptures and all the answers. So this note from MIT uh, uh, lecture on linear algebra contains a uh, uh, solution actually. We can look into them. So interestingly, uh, um, in, even in this case, even if you only get one state, um, dominant eigenstate, you can still get problems through, through solve in an efficient way. Yeah. Because, because there, 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 there is definitely an inefficient way. That is, uh, you just uh, uh, doing the back propagation into the lectures. Then you, you can imagine you are going to pay lots of memory and so on because you need to store many of the intermediate vector. But uh, the solution I'm suggesting here is a way to wrap lecture solver as one uh, 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 primitive in AD. So uh, I let you to have fun with, with this. And uh, the other question that's related to Kawashima Sensei's uh, question. Um, in, in this one dimensional case, uh, uh, I think from quantum mechanics, we know that there is no degeneracy. This is proven. So if we want to apply that to high dimensional case, uh, what happens if I got ground state degeneracy, right? Because uh, from, from this intuition you already see, this is the first order perturbation theory in either forward and reverse mode. Then in the denominator, there, there is going to be energy difference. So then in case of degeneracy, the whole thing will blow up. What uh, should we do? So that's another exercise uh, we can think about. Um, okay, so that's, then, then, then let me move on to the uh, next part.
another set of examples about uh, uh, ordinary differential equations. So that was quite a recent uh, progress. Actually, uh, one of the so-called neural D worm, um, 2018 best, uh, NIPS best paper award. That's only four out of a few thousand papers. That was considered uh, to be a um, like a big pro big uh, step in uh, those uh, deep neural network uh, community. So the the idea was to uh, draw analog between these two diagrams. So because uh, in a deep neural network uh, community, so when people want to train very deep neural network, sometimes people will say that the gradient vanish. So uh, because in principle, if you keep increase the depth, uh, the performance shouldn't be uh, become. Uh, even worse, because you see, uh, in principle, this uh, <coughs> additional layer uh, at the at the bottom line, you, you can just uh, do identical transformation, right? So increasing depth shouldn't uh, worsen my performance. Uh, however, this was not the case. Uh, very often, when people increase the depth, uh, they say the performance decreases. So uh, then, this so-called residual network uh, was the uh, invention to solve to solve this question. So look, what, what they did was, uh, they, they imagine this is a one neural network layer. So this block contains some neural network. <coughs> so instead of uh, uh, doing this transformation directly, what they did was uh, they copied the input um, directly to the output and uh, add that together to um, the result of the transformation. So this is called a residual network. The idea is quite simple. They use the neural network uh, to train correction. They do not train the update directly. So imagine that if I initialize the weight all close to be zero, such that this block initially was doing almost the identity transformation, then this layer is like transparent. So I can keep on adding many of those residue blocks without uh, worsening my performance. Then I train lots of corrections. But uh, a crucial thing to notice is that is uh, this looks like uh, OLA method when you integrate ordinary differential equation. So imagine you had an ODE, the simplest way to, to, to integrate that is actually discard like that. So if, if I put epsilon uh, time step here. So this <coughs> gives us a, a perspective or a way to view uh, many of those deep neural network architecture as discretization of certain dynamical system. So initially I really had some continuous dynamics. So I had some input distribution, some output distribution where I want to connect. Actually, in theory, uh, in, the, in, the, in the really beautiful theory, that's a set of dynamical system, ODE. And only when I want to realize that on my computer, I discard test them. So that, that was the connection between uh, neural network and ordinary differential equations. And uh, uh, this neural ODE paper, what they did was, uh, again, to compare that, right? So before, what people had was this step-by-step, uh, -step, constant time step um, update in a residual network. But uh, once, once you formulate, formulate that as a continuous time dynamics, you can use uh, like adaptive time step, depending on the curvature, you, 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 you can choose the time step. And uh, when you talk about the depth of your neural network, so here is one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. But here, you don't care about the uh, like depth, because the depth is a var variable that uh, uh, was adjusted automatically. You, you, you can think that you only care about the integration time. Or maybe you, you can talk about even infinite deep uh, neural network. Because the depth was not uh, the important thing. The, 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 the integrator can automatically adjust the time step of integration. And uh, they got actually uh, nice performance for many of the interesting tasks and so on. And uh, I, I leave this as a, another uh, exercise because uh, um, th this was related to the comb graph. Uh, but uh, here, to derive the back propagation rule through an ODE solver, you need to first consider this, uh, what, what, what's the like, uh, competition graph for an ODE integrator. Then, then once you write down those equations for the joint, the next step to do is to take continuous time limit, right? You need to really take uh, like epsilon approach to zero. Then interestingly, you will see that uh, the joint themselves satisfy another set of ordinary differential equation. 
So that's actually the good news. That means that, uh, um, because you might worry that if I have infinite deep neural network, does that mean I need to store infinite amount of uh, information? So actually that's not the case. Because a joint satisfies another set of uh, ordinary differential equation, which means that uh, uh, you can just, uh, uh, let's say, do the forward pass, like evaluate the function, or in other words, like integrate the, the ODE forward. Then you, you define your joint in the end, then you just integrate another set of ordinary differential equation for the adjoints until you reach the end. Then this automatically gives you the gradient with respect to uh, those parameters in, in, the, in the force or in the updates. So um, that's a, a beautiful piece of math, um, but I also need to uh, mention that uh, those things, again, historically was uh, already um, developed independent of all those deep learning stuff because uh, this was called uh, sensitivity analysis in ODE. So in ODE uh, community and ODE literature, so this was known for decades because people care about uh, uh, like uh, in dynamical control or, or optimal control uh, ODE uh, integration uh, community. People care about those gradient. Or the, actually, the word adjoint was coming from uh, this community. But uh, until uh, last year, there was no kind of a merge between the two. And now, now we see that they are all the same thing. And uh, why do we really need uh, such an ordinary differential equation? Um, I already explained. This has con constant memory usage. Uh, again, this was like what I mentioned for the, uh, for the LaPak linear algebra solver. So here, if you um, uh, derived the uh, a joint back propagation rule, uh, you, might, you will notice that uh, uh, you can use a black box ODE integrator because uh, you do not have to uh, differentiate into the ODE integrator. You can use uh, uh, whatever existing ODE integrator help you to integrate the equations for the joint. And uh, lo those uh, things can have adaptive step size. And sometimes we know for, uh, for a steep ODE, uh, steep ODE, we need to use implicit scheme. But the implicit scheme invo usually involves uh, self-consistence uh, or, or some kind of a root solver inside. But uh, uh, for those, you are not afraid of it because then you can apply AD even for a root solver. So I mean, along those things, uh, there are uh, all, all kinds of interesting, I think, I think the numerical uh, perspective, that numerical aspect we can uh, discuss. The, uh, if you if you need to do it, you can you can go into details. So now we talk about applications of those neural ODEs in terms of physics or science. I think uh, those are quite obvious examples. So imagine we have some dynamic systems where we want to control, meaning that's my uh, ODE. Imagine here I had a theta, meaning some control parameter to the force. And uh, uh, what we can do is uh, we just integrate uh, those ODEs forward and. Uh, Compute the joint with respect to those parameters and tune those parameters. So it's a, it's a nice way to um, to, to to study uh, control problem because you can also parameterize that with a deep neural network with many flexible uh, function approximation scheme. So that, that that's an interesting way of doing those uh, dynamical control problem using uh, deep learning uh, techniques. So the, the other thing related to physics is that many of the physical problem was formulated in this form, the principle of least action, so mechanics, optics, and so on. So essentially, that, there is also an ODE hidden here, because uh, uh, if you just take gradient with respect to the action, basically this is saying that uh, the Lagrangian um, is playing the same role as the force and there is an ODE for the action. So that's why uh, this gives us uh, quite a general framework to solve many of those uh, uh, physics problems. And uh, I haven't seen too many um, applications, but uh, let me, uh, just another, another demo, let me show you this uh, <laughs> famous example. So it's called a branches call problem, but anyway, you, you, that, that's uh, what we learned from high school. So the, the problem of uh, 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 rapid, rapid descent. 
So you want to design the, the path. So uh, the, the ball reaches the final point uh, in the least amount of time. Again, if you remember, that's the Bonolis kind of a formulation. So the, the, the cost function is the time. That depends on a parameterized form of this y as function of x. That's a one-dimensional curve. So, um, <coughs> and those x0, x1, those are the like starting point and the ending point. So th those are the fixed. What we want to learn here is the curve y as function of x. So um, I uh, just prepared another uh, demo for, 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 for this um, using uh, this recent progress of uh, uh, neural OD. Um, later you can, can, can uh, check uh, details. But uh, this, this relies on <coughs> this library uh, written by those authors of neural OD. It's called uh, Torch uh, DFEQ. So it's, a, it's an implementation of a neural OD in, in PyTorch. Uh, what we were been doing was just to parameterize a multilinear perception uh, with one input and one output as, uh, as this function, y as function of x. And uh, since we need to fix both ends, but, but uh, that, that, that's kind of uh, easy, you just uh, um, subtract some constant, so, so it always starts from, from, from the given um, time and uh, given uh, ends. Then, then, then uh, like, like uh, what we were always doing for a neural network and uh, machine learning, let's define the forward path. The forward path basically implements this uh, integration. So it integrates the integrand from x1 to x, uh, uh, from x0 to x1, so we got time. And uh, time will be my um, objective function, my loss function. And uh, we again just use an optimizer from PyTorch to optimize this. So now you see uh, this example contains neural network, also contains uh, integration of the uh, ordinary differential equation. So um, it solves the <laughs> ancient uh, problem uh, in a like Maybe quite a stupid way, but, but here I'm doing the animation. That's the exact from Bernoulli, maybe. I think that's the solution from Bernoulli. It's a, it's a known, it's called a cycloid curve. And uh, with the like, step of iteration, that's the neural network uh, output to this y of x. So um, you might wonder, this is so such a simple problem, right? It's like fitting a curve. So actually it's not, right? So for each of the optimization scheme, what we were been doing is to fix this uh, parameterized line, then integrate an ordinary differential equation uh, in space to get some time. Then we, for the optimization scheme, we were been taking the adjoint or the gradient with respect to all the parameters in that neural network. So then in the next step, we tune this curve. So it looks like we are fitting to, to curves, but because there are so many equations and integrations uh, behind, so it's uh, much slower uh, than you can imagine. But uh, if you are patient enough, uh, uh, if you run to, like for two minutes, so this will more or less converge to the exact uh, result. Uh, not perfectly, because uh, um, we parameterize uh, this neural network using this curve using a neural network. There is some expressibility uh, limitation and so on. But I just show this to you as a, an example of uh, doing some kind of uh, I would say non-conventional application of uh, those frameworks. But I think how, those how do you parameterize this curve? Yes. So so this curve is parameterized as a neural network that has two hidden uh, layers. So yeah, so you can already see here. It's a, input is x, output is uh, y, and uh, in the middle there are uh, like uh, so-called uh, dense layers or linear layers. Uh, with some, yeah, it's like that. Yeah. 
So um, that's another demo. So Hadrian told you about the uh, applications for tensor networks. <coughs> and uh, you can check his that talk. Hadrian and Paul also talked about that. That's a logo we made for this paper. And uh, yesterday Hadrian took this pi nice picture of uh, Dr. Paul. I think we had the same design idea. Yeah, I really like it. Yeah. And uh, that's another exercise uh, if you uh, want to um, understand the idea of uh, taking gradient with respect to tensor networks better. So uh, that's actually related to Lawrence's lecture last week. So here is a simplified setup, like one dimensional uh, uniform MPS. That's an infinite MPS. And at a certain point, you insert an operator, Hamiltonian operator. And uh, that is actually your Hamiltonian energy density. So uh, the goal is to minimize this A, but you see that this A tensor appears uh, everywhere. And uh, if you take gradient, um, this is Lorentz result, you, 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 you have all those things, right? Because you have local ones, non-local ones, and there will be some infinite series. So now, uh, in the automatic differentiation uh, uh, scheme, what we uh, care about is only uh, how do you evaluate this guy. So you do not care about the, what, what's the gradient because the gradient will be computed automatically for you. So then, then that's a simple problem because you can just uh, contract the whole thing from left, right, build an environment and uh, locally contract this. So th this is a nice uh, uh, exercise if you want to uh, play with the, the trick. I think uh, using PyTorch, using all the facility, I think this can be done with uh, maybe 20 lines. I think you agree, 20 lines, you can, maybe? Is that, anyway, I think definitely not, uh, not, not, not more than um, 100 lines, you can, you can do all this stuff. But uh, for this example, uh, if you do it in this way, uh, it will not be uh, better than rational uniform MPS that uh, Lawrence was uh, teaching us. Um, that was because view MPS make, really make use of canonicalization and uh, uh, the one-dimensional stru uh, the structure of MPS and so on. So uh, that's an access, but it's not for production. And uh, what AD was really useful was to a uh, high-dimension problem. Uh, it's, for example, for optimizing your paths. Because here, um, for ordinary paths, we don't know, do not know how to uh, bring that into a canonical form. And if we take gradient, we got all those horrible things. And uh, um, that, that, that's another point that is, uh, um, in those high dimensional case, two dimensional observation of the paths, in the end, if you apply AD to this energy expectation value and doing optimization, uh, there is a subtle issue. So in the end, those two things, they are not uh, um, actually equivalent. So in 1D, they are equivalent because in 1D, the contraction was done um, um, accurately because uh, um, for 1D, you can always, if I, if, if, there, there was no truncation and, and so on. Um, but, but in 2D, uh, those strategy of Philippe Corbeau and Lawrence was uh, actually, they first uh, derive the analytical expression of the gradient as an infinite sum of infinite tensor networks. Then, uh, to evaluate those gradient, they need to apply approximations. So when contracting all those things, there, there are all those uh, truncations to the corner transformatrix or edge or, or, or the other things. So we call this approximate the derivative. And uh, in this AD scheme, so what we were doing is, uh, um, first you, 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 you uh, approximately contract the tensor network using, for example, corner transformatrix. Then this automatic differentiation is uh, uh, taking the gradient to the commutation process. So it's an exact gradient to this uh, approximate contraction scheme. So I hope you can tell the difference. But in that, the, the consequence is that uh, in this scheme, the gradient and the energy, they are evaluated in a two, in the, two independent program. And uh, for, for example, to convert the gradient, you need to have a larger uh, chi, so larger cutoff. Uh, otherwise, uh, the gradient will bring the energy to a different uh, place and so on. 
But here, since uh, there is only a single pro program, so and uh, um, you would not worry about uh, that uh, this uh, uh, relative small chi for the energy uh, evaluation cause problem to the gradient. So in the end, you are taking the gradient of the, this approximate proof. I hope this is clear, but it's a subtle issue. But it turns out that in 2D, this make, make, make a difference. And, uh, uh, I hope this answers some of the questions uh, by you, because those questions are related to what's the, in the end, what's the difference? Uh, there are subtle differences here. Uh, what about uh, numerical instability? Numerical instability in this, like uh, this, uh, uh, you mean the degenerate energy, degenerate uh, quantum? So, I mean, the thing is you want to take the gradient and just to optimize it. Yeah. To get a bit wrong um, Yeah. So, in, in the, this uh, differential programming scheme, is it more stable or? So, more stable than this one? But, uh, but uh, in, in those examples, uh, um, with a stabilization uh, step to the SVD back propagation, then it's stable. Mm -hmm. So that we didn't say, but uh, unless the competition graph is too deep. So sometimes if, uh, for example, uh, we, we, we evaluate this same environment things using uh, corner transfer matrix, then there's an iteration. But then this iteration scheme uh, a step corresponds to the depth of the computation graph. And then if this is too deep, there would be some problem related to gradient vanishing or gradient exploding. And uh, Hadrian had a way to uh, kind of truncate uh, those uh, gradient. So then you, you introduce uh, approximation to the gradient evaluation, but you prevent uh, uh, those gradient to uh, blow up. Some kind of virtualization. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, right. Um, those things happen. Um, so, uh, with, with many of those examples, I hope you, I bring to you some of those uh, bigger picture because you see for, for that paper we can call it automatic differentiation for um, tensor networks. But why we were choosing this word differentiable programming? Because that was because uh, uh, at least uh, to my mind, so optimization is just one kind of application. So you, we, we saw like ODEs, like inverse problems. I think uh, collectively they. Um, um, from those kind of new concepts, of course it's like rebranding, but the idea was really uh, popular in machine learning. The idea was that in traditional way of writing programs, we had input and then we just compose this program. And then it, they gi it gives us an output. But machine learning uh, taught us a different way of doing that. So we had some input and then we had some desired output. But we don't know how to connect those two. But machine learning uh, people, what they did was uh, they just uh, uh, parameterize some uh, trainable architecture and keep on training those uh, uh, parameters in the end it will get uh, for example a program for example a program in the form of neural network so um, if you compare those two this is like a new way of programming or de dealing with computers it just uh, assemble lots of uh, components flexible components even though you don't know how to write the program but still you can in that get a useful program. And uh, the Andrew Capacity was uh, uh, a student at, uh, um, a star student at uh, uh, Stanford. If you look at his uh, CS uh, 231N lecture, lecture, you might be familiar with him. Now he's the director of AI at Tesla. He had this uh, quite an influential poster. Uh, this is so-called program space. So all the compatible and useful program. And that's, that, that red dot is uh, what human can Right, because we had a limited intelligence, limited time, and uh, those are called software 1.0. But uh, he was imagining a soft, another space called a software 2.0, where you just uh, specify some search space, and that gradient descent uh, do the search for you until you reach some useful uh, program. And uh, differentiable programming is the way to write software 2.0. And he listed many of the uh, advantages, right? The last one is better than human. And uh, mm, so uh, that's some, uh, I think, uh, rebranding. But uh, like deep learning is also rebranding of uh, 
a good idea, neural network. So, so now, obviously, differentiable programming is just another way of reprogramming uh, deep learning. But uh, uh, if we throw away all those hypes, but I still see some opportunity there, right? Because it's, it's pointing out some uh, uh, ideas and directions that we can go in the future. And uh, since we talk about differential programming for some classical setup, neural networks and tensor networks, and uh, actually there was a hidden thread, uh, not, not, not actually topic of this, but I, I want to show this to you. There was this connection between neural network to probabilistic, gra probabilistic graphic model to tensor networks, then to uh, quantum circuits. So um, about the connection is, uh, is a whole another talk, but uh, uh, I want to show you another some examples of applying this idea to quantum circuits. So um, that's a concrete uh, algorithms and also application. So called the variational quantum argon solver. Essentially, it's doing the same variational calculation like we did using uh, tensor networks, except that uh, they replace the variational onsets by some quant actual quantum hardware. It's a parameterized quantum circuit where each gate has uh, certain parameters. And uh, uh, you see, uh, you can run the circuit and collect lots of measurement observables. Then you combine them into your Hamiltonian expected value, which of course depends on the parameter. Then you, clo you can close this uh, optimization loop. Um, there were already experiments on actual device. So that's uh, Google ones. They use uh, actually two qubits to solve hydrogen molecule. Uh, IBM had uh, six qubits of the brilliant hydrogen uh, molecule. But if you look into the optimization scheme, so it's really uh, uh, simple. <laughs> So Google has only one variational parameter for that uh, two, cube, two qubit circuit. So what they were doing was just uh, scan uh, that uh, parameter in a very fine mesh. And uh, then they just uh, look for this minimum. And uh, IBM had uh, uh, 30 of those uh, variational parameters. And what they did, because you see, uh, quantum circuit is an actual device. So what, what, what you can do is just run them to collect expected values. So it, it's not obvious at all how do you get a gradient and so on. So that's why um, in those early work, like 17, even 17, what they were doing was like, like an, uh, numerically estimated uh, derivative and uh, doing uh, stochastic gradient descent. And, uh, but you can imagine this is very difficult because uh, uh, you want to take gradient uh, from noisy um, snapshots. Actually, those two plots were my initial motivation of kind of going a little bit towards these directions because we know those optimizations wouldn't uh, scale up if you have many parameters. And uh, that initially brings the concept of so-called differentiable quantum circuit. So here, the word differentiable um, does not mean that you can uh, compute the gradient in a classical simulator. Because if you, if you sim simulate a circuit on a classical computer, definitely you can, you can take the gradient. So here, the differentiable really means that uh, as an actual device, there's a way to uh, measure the gradient of the energy function with respect to the uh, param with respect to circuit parameters. And uh, actually, uh, that's very recent, and those two are uh, from uh, Japan. I think those are now quite influential paper. So in, in that, it was quite a uh, simple idea of initially from NMR people. So if, as long as you parameterize those uh, single qubit gates or two qubit gates in this form where sigma squared to one, then after a simple exercise, you are going to see that the gradient of the Hamiltonian uh, with respect to this theta can be written as two terms. And uh, what you need to do is to shift this parameter by half pi and minus half pi and do two sets of independent measurement and taking the difference you got and by the gradient of the energy on the quantum circuit. So that, that's actually the way now uh, people suggested how should we um, take gradient and optimize the quantum uh, circuit. So, um, on that note, I also want to share with you this, this, this paper. It's a survey paper written by a DeepMind uh, scientist. 
So it's about the Monte Carlo gradient estimation uh, in machine learning. So the, the central uh, thing, the, the, the object they care about is this. So imagine you had some parameterized distribution, and uh, you want to evaluate the expected, expected value of some function uh, on those uh, distribution, and then you want to take gradient with respect to parameter in this distribution. And uh, they are so-called gradient estimator. So um, actually, machine learning people, they knew three, wait, three different gradient estimators. So um, in variation normal color calculation, what we were always doing was actually one of them, called score function gradient estimator. That is something that machine learning people uh, try a lot to do, because this gradient estimator has uh, uh, big variance, and uh, you, they usually avoid doing that, or do lots of control variant for it. And uh, this gradient estimator on the quantum circuit is also known to machine learning people called the measure value of the gradient estimator. And uh, what they were always doing, or trying to do, was so-called pathwise estimator. So you see that's a guidance. So let me, let me, let me give you, let me, let me go into details and tell you what, what are those things. So that's the object. You see, it's, a, it's really uh, relevant to many of those things we care about, rational inference, Monte Carlo, and so on. So um, the score function gradient estimator, uh, is also called reinforced. So, so imagine I'm doing variational Monte Carlo. So th then the thing here is my local energy. And uh, P theta is actually my wave function square. And uh, uh, in variational Monte Carlo, what we usually uh, learn is uh, um, first expand that, maybe I should write it. Do I have enough time? Yeah. Uh, let me write it so it's more clear. So, so gradient theta, uh, if, if, I, if I just uh, expand it, so this is the summation of uh, x, p theta, x, f, x. And uh, now, now, now obviously, this, this gradient, we will act on will act on this, but then let's do a trick. This guy <coughs> equals to uh, gradient theta log p times p, right? Because the uh, gradient log p will give me uh, one thing in denominator, one thing in denominator. But, but then, then this will become uh, summation of x p gradient log p and times f, and and, and this is again the expected value x joined from p of theta, and here I will get f gradient log p. So this is so-called a score function gradient, and uh, um, um, I want to contrast that with another set of uh, the gradient, where they call uh, passwise estimator. So here the idea was uh, um, we uh, imagine to parameterize some uh, function transformation from another set of variable called z. Z might satisfy, for example, Gaussian distribution, which does not contain uh, the parameters that I want to take gradient. But uh, I put the uh, parameter into the transformation itself. Then, then obviously, if I, if I just uh, substitute g of z into that expression, so sampling from this distribution translate into sampling z from a uh, <coughs> normal distribution, for example, that is independent from any parameter. Then I can move this uh, gradient theta uh, inside this expected value, and I replace x by g theta of that. So in that, what was the difference? The difference is here. So in, the, in, in, in this kind of gradient estimator, so imagine that's my local energy. So when I try to optimize the function, I only use the scalar value. I'm using the value of the loss function, of the, the, the local energy. While well, here, by applying the chain rule, so if I expand it, so I can, I can even get access to the gradient information of my local energy. And uh, empirically, uh, actually that was also in the review paper, uh, people find out 
those two gradient estimates, they give the, of course, the same mean, same mean, same estimation for the uh, gradient. However, this guy has much smaller uh, loss. Uh, uh, sorry, so too much smaller variance. So another good point of this, so imagine if we can do that. So if, if, I'm, if I'm doing, if I'm trying to estimating the gradient estimator in this form, I need to do much polis sampling for this P of theta x. So I want to, I will build up a Markov chain and estimate what's, what's inside. However, here, if I manage to, to, to push all the dependence into the function information, so here I can do direct sampling. So I always sample from the normal distribution. And for each of the estimation, I got an unbiased uh, estimator without any correlation. So that, that, that's the reason why uh, in machine learning applications, whenever possible, they always translate the, the gradient estimator in, in this form. Uh, uh, unless, in that, of course, there are some catch, right? For, 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 so yeah. In the case of pass based estimator, which part contain the original distribution, P of C? Sorry, question. Yeah, if you define a new function, G of C, yes. but uh, this function contains the original distribution of X, P yeah. of C, information of uh, original. Right. So, so you have to say here hey, are kind of a, a different way, but that's also related to my supposed uh, talk. So, so, so you see the, the, the goal usually we play with was like uh, we want to parameterize a uh, learnable distribution, but uh, <coughs> so, 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 so like both my machine or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, so you can you can directly parameterize it, but that's only one way. So the other way of doing that is uh, suppose we got. Uh, so-called base distribution, and and we we, we we apply transformation to to the base distribution to get some sample. Then this transformation will kind of induce um, a, a, a parameterized distribution. So by parameterizing the transformation instead of uh, the distribution, you you gain some uh, advantage. Yeah. So that, that so that's a, a yeah. It, it means that this G function. New function G is not so simple, so it's right. very complicated. It, it is complicated. So that's why people usually use a neural network for, for, for uh, that. Usually invertible neural network. That was because uh, <coughs> if it's an invertible, then um, the Jacobian determinant is uh, very defined and so on. Yeah. It's also tractable and so on. Yeah. So that, that was very uh, kind of related to the talk and many other things. Um, once you had a gradient, uh, in the case of quantum circuit, in the case of rational Monte Carlo, and in many other cases, uh, the, the goal is to do stochastic, uh, stochastic organization with noisy gradient. Again, that was something we can learn from machine learning people because they uh, develop all kinds of flavors of uh, uh, first of all, the noisy uh, stochastic gradient uh, method. So. That's the first part, differentiable programming. You see the way to compare the gradient and uh, all kinds of uh, applications to eigensolvers, ODEs, and uh, once you have gradient, how do you estimate them? How do you apply them? So many of the things I think that's, uh, um, uh, I believe to be, uh, I, I believe that they are useful. So I call them key technology behind it. So now we, we are ready to move on to the second part. Uh, I call it the learning representation. So before that, any questions? Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, love page. Yes. Uh, love, love. Uh, how, how do you define the uh, function g, g theta? G theta. How do I define, how do I determine it? Oh, uh, what, um, I, I do not understand the, the function g. G, uh, yeah. So, so, so you see, in, 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 in so here the, the, the goal, the goal was, uh, to so so the thing we want to to, to learn is actually this guy, a parameterized distribution, okay, and uh, um, so in for example, imagine that you are doing Macalo, a version of Macalo, the way you you you, you did that was use a tensor path, right, square path to define this distribution. 
But I'm, no, no I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, there's another way to define this distribution. Because uh, you can start from, uh, okay, let me, let me take one step back. The difficulty was all about uh, uh, how do you take the gradient with respect to some sampling procedure, okay? And uh, by, by, by pushing all the parameters into this transformation, uh, you can easily move this gradient into the expectation, and uh, you define that uh, distribution indirectly using this transformation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how do you choose uh, uh, a new function? How, how do I cho choose this G? Yeah, yeah. This G was, maybe I think uh, uh, if I had enough time, I can really show you concrete examples. But, but, but for now, let me just, uh, 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 to be brief, uh, saying that this is an invertible neural network uh, parameterized by whatever parameter. Because, because you see, what, I, what we want to do is just uh, to induce a nonlinear, high dimensional nonlinear transformation to my no noise. So, so you know that the nonlinear transformation can deform the distribution, right? So if this transformation was uh, flexible enough, then in principle I can deform Gaussian distribution into anything. So that, that was the idea. Okay, so, so learning representation, so that was uh, already something quite familiar to uh, deep neural network because you see that was a uh, uh, second figure from the book. So usually if you train a deep neural network, um, interestingly, um, the low level neurons pick up some uh, simple microscopic uh, feature like uh, edge, sudden change of the, uh, the, the imaging, uh, the, the, the pixels. So it's like, like all these corner contours. And, and if you go on, uh, some more abstract feature will emerge. And uh, based on that, neural network can uh, perform classification. So uh, actually, when a neural network, and how a neural network is doing that was not fully understood. But anyway, um, by uh, either understanding it or just making use of it, uh, people can do uh, fun things. So, for example, you can do neural style uh, transfer. So you take one imaging, and uh, because because this learning representation naturally separate uh, so-called uh, uh, texture with content. So mathematically, we don't know we don't even know how to define content or, or texture for uh, imaging because we don't know how to write down the mathematical expression. But anyway, this neural network naturally separate them. The content was more in the high level, but the texture, they, are, they live in the low level neurons. So once you have them separated, you can uh, like mix uh, style and uh, content uh, of the imaging. And uh, uh, I talk about this, this latent space data interpolation was also because uh, in the latent space, you get uh, uh, more independent global features where you can manipulate them. and. Uh, map them back to the imaging space. Therefore, you can do smooth interpolation uh, to, to human faces. And those things find uh, applications in science. And uh, that's uh, <coughs> uh, quite an early paper about uh, automatic chemical design. And uh, the idea was to design small drugs. And usually those small molecules, they had a so-called SMILES uh, representation. So basically that uh, is a translation from the molecule to uh, 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 sentence, let's say, so with carbon, nitrogen, and so on. It's a, it's a uh, string of characters. And uh, uh, what they were doing was trying to um, um, design the right smiles uh, so it has the desired property. Imagine um, how should we do that, because essentially that's kind of optimization problem, but uh, that is a discrete optimization, because uh, um, the, the, the variable you want to change are just the characters, C, N, or O, right, for different atoms. And uh, this is a, uh, not, not so easy to do. But what they did was uh, they, they trained a so-called uh, autoencoder that map those uh, smiles into a so-called latent space where they had a continuous uh, representation in a relatively low dimension. So this also makes uh, the distribution of the original molecules more compact and uh, 
uh, independent because uh, uh, imagine in this space, if you just uh, uh, make a narrow to one of the atom, probably that's a, an, a illegal uh, chemical expression and so on. But, but once you learn the distribution of the whole thing into the latent space, um, you can freely move in such a latent space. Then this optimization problem becomes the, the gradient ascent or gradient descent in the latent space. Because what you want to do is take gradient of the chemical properties with respect to the continuous latent vector. So you just do the gradient ascent until you find some point uh, in the latent space. Then you use a decoder to map it back to the original chemical space. Uh, that suggests to you a new chemical uh, compound. You might suggest your experimental friend to synthesize. So this is the idea of uh, doing learning uh, using this uh, representation of a uh, deep neural network. So that was the application to galaxy. So we know we can uh, predict the human face. How, 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 how am I going to look like uh, after 20 years? But uh, if you apply the same thing to a <coughs> galaxy, you can interpret, predict the shape of galaxy. And uh, um, those learning representation, uh, I think, at least to me, had uh, other two uh, quite uh, interesting connections to, connect to, to many things that I care about. The one thing is uh, one thing is the normalization group. The other thing is the Monte Carlo updates. So I'm going to explain uh, to you many of the uh, uh, connections. And, uh, but I would also say uh, in those two fields, uh, many of the things are still open. So anyway, so the idea about uh, renormalization group, we all remember, right? So starting from some microscopic uh, configurations, we can do block decimation uh, or majority rule. And uh, we will get uh, some uh, collective variables where they had their uh, own effective theory. But basically, this one step of RG transformation uh, <coughs> defines the flow in the, so in, the, in, the, in the space of different Hamiltonians. And uh, since it's a flow, it's, it's going to have fixed points, and uh, it's also going to have uh, critical points, uh, basically it's a settle point, that actually corresponds to phase transition and so on. And uh, um, now, um, those looks like uh, very appealing and quite similar to many of the phenomena in a deep neural network. So that's, that's why even from like a few years ago, there were already a series of papers discussing the connection between RG flow and uh, the flow from microscopic uh, pixels to the class, uh, to the class uh, category information. So whether that also defines RG flow or not, that was uh, uh, actually and, uh, somewhat under debate. But uh, on the other hand, in deep learning, uh, there was another phenomenon called the uh, adversary attack. So you can train a neural network that uh, classifies this as a panda with certain kind of confidence. But uh, uh, the crucial thing is that you can apply some epsilon perturbation to that input image. Then you can confuse the neural network. Neural network will believe that with 99% this is going to be uh, a gimbal, so not, not a panda anymore. So again, this, this, this can be very dangerous if we do not understand or, or if you cannot control this. How are we going to uh, trust the performance of a different neural network if we put that to medical system or self-driving cars? So that's why there, there are many works trying to understand or trying to avoid this phenomenon. So one of the ways uh, of doing that was related to, to RG. So that's, a, that's some papers on this topic. So essentially, now the perspective is that uh, um, we view this kind of perturbation as a perturbation along some uh, relevant uh, direction that uh, drives us away from the RG flow. If we believe what happens in a deep neural network with RG, so um, then if we formulate uh, this adversary attack in that language. The ne ne next question is uh, how should we design a um, flow that is uh, uh, free from those uh, critical points? Or maybe uh, even if there is a critical point, how should we um, kind of protect against uh, those kind of attack? Right? How, how should we design uh, some kind of a scheme so, so um, the, 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 this stable, uh, instable direction 
is uh, somehow uh, become stable or maybe different. But, but anyway, those, those are the um, <coughs> ongoing or maybe very vague ideas. I haven't seen a uh, constructive outcome along this line, but uh, that looks to me an interesting direction. And, uh, in this particular case, maybe this kind of noise was not taken into account in the in training process. No, no, in the training procedure, they did not uh, apply this, this mm -hmm. noise. Uh, but uh, to make up, to, to find out uh, the right uh, perturbation, that's another set of training mm -hmm. on purpose to uh, make it wrong. But then they find this perturbation. Yeah. And uh, um, I just I give you some ideas because uh, yeah, yeah of course yeah. I mean it, maybe my comment is completely irrelevant <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, it is relevant it, it is relevant because, uh, uh, because uh, I show this because I found this to be interesting but uh, I, I, I besides what was listening here I do not have much to say but I, I want to trigger kind of interest what what, what, I, what, is I, what it I, possible that the yeah. current architecture they have uh, too much redundant Increase of freedom. That, that you, 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 there's a degree of freedom that you can play with. Yeah. So so maybe relevant perturbation. Yeah. Maybe so. It's it's about this space, right? Space is so big. That, that would be my always some uh, dangerous direction. So if that was the case, uh, maybe what we need to do was to kind of compress the model so it's less less flexible. Maybe that was at the cost of uh, losing some performance. But I guess maybe for robustness or security, we, we are willing to do that. that, that, that that's, okay. yeah, indeed, can be, some, can be an idea. And uh, what, what I um, can uh, comment more was uh, on those uh, uh, kind of connection to <coughs> other things. So uh, here I'm showing you a wavelet transformation, a simple one. So wavelet basically means that you take an imaging, and here you take a difference between images, and then you uh, take the mean of uh, next nearest neighbor pixels to the other paths. Then, then on the mean, you do another set of iteration. So if you make it as a diagram, it looks like that. Uh, in wavelet transformation, they call this uh, uh, smooth and the detailed components. So you just uh, keep on doing the same transformation to the smooth part. In that, you, you build up the transformation. So if I draw it as a diagram, so um, that's an interesting uh, set point, uh, starting point because we can really view this diagram as a, from different perspective. So it's, a wave, it's indeed a wavelet transformation. But on the other hand, as pointed out by many of those people, that, that's also um, <coughs> a tensor network. In this case, it's a um, tree tensor network, but if you stack other things in between, it can be a mirror. And uh, since those things, they are unitary matrix, you can also view this as a quantum circuit. It's doing a linear transformation. And uh, definitely for a linear transformation like that, you can also view that as a neural network. So that's why, uh, that's a simple toy example that does a wavelet transformation from physical space to, that, that's called latent space. But uh, uh, it's a, a cute example uh, of many different things. And uh, if I take the uh, neural network perspective, a very natural thing to do is to generalize those transformations from linear ones to nonlinear ones. Because this is what uh, a neural network is good at. Another thing is that uh, as, a wavelet, as a wavelet, all the transformation is fixed. So we learned uh, from textbook there are several kinds of uh, wavelets. So different kinds, different flavors, different and even or maybe fully transform, but in any case, it's fixed. People uh, told you how to do the transformation, but neural network is more interesting because uh, um, each block can be adaptive, so it's learnable. So uh, that that's the reason why we, we, we come up with this kind of setup. But uh, each block becomes an invertible uh, neural network that's a nonlinear transformation, and that was related to to many of the discussion here. So you see this hierarchical neural network then is a way to uh, connect the uh, simple Gaussian distribution in the latent space with uh, physical distribution uh, in, the, in the data space. And uh, 
Again, this is trainable, and also if you, you can imagine that you wrap this up on a disk, and all those latent variables take out of the disk. The people call them bulk <coughs> variable in the holographic duality uh, study, and all those variables they live on the edge. The importantly, they are the same amount of those variables, and uh, each of the this node is a uh, invertible transformation between them. And uh, now the interesting thing is that you can you can. You can put, for example, some critical uh, field theory on the boundary and train the network such that uh, uh, in the bulk you translate into a gapful uh, theory. That is actually a realization of the holographic duality. And uh, my clever Yi Zhuang took this setup and played around with this XY model and interesting things. So typically, when you see this diagram, Usually, people meant uh, cancer network or MIRA. But, uh, and because of this kind of similarity mm -hmm. and all the connections, uh, here we, we make this as a bijective neural network. So, that was the idea behind, uh, behind, behind this. And uh, so, that's about RG. So, the next thing is about Monte Carlo. So, you, 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 um, so, so, here I'm showing you local versus, uh, because that's well my hobby, play around with updates, right? So, uh, I think model, so spin up down, you see local update, so it's quite slow. So this guy flips the spin quite uh, efficiently. So this was called a, a cluster update, so Swiss and Wang, Wolf update. So that's an example of a uh, um, 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 more than Moore's law speed up, because you can put this to a modern computer, and put this to a 30 years old computer. And uh, this would be still be faster because uh, uh, of the algorithmic uh, uh, development. And another cool thing is that when you look into the class update code, uh, it's not uh, more difficult uh, than this one. Maybe just a file, five lines more. But uh, again, it took people many years to uh, invent class update. I think the math for the class update, like Swiss and Wang was already written somewhere in the mapping from IC model to like random bound population problem. Even in Buckster's, uh, uh, we are talking about about Buckster again. Even his his textbook, but uh, it was until 1987 something that Swiss and Wang come up with this. So we uh, really would like to have a general framework that allows us to explore those more efficient uh, um, color updates. And uh, I believe those uh, ideas of having a um, latent space uh, can be uh, useful. So why monocolo updates usually are difficult? That's because physics happens on a manifold. So consider some frustrated ma magnet or even critical systems. So you have your variables. And what you want to do is like to, to, to move on those manifolds. However, this manifold was given by the physics. So once you once you violate the constraint of the var uh, of the manifold, um, you will get rejected. So, but uh, the whole idea of uh, learning a representation is about how should you unfold this manifold into some simple simpler distribution where each of the variable get uh, independent or disentangled. So in that that was their language, and. Um, uh, so using that uh, like deep neural network setup, we, we, we tried one of these. So, so we just set up this neural network and uh, learn the transformation between the physical energy and the latent space. The goal was to push that. Oh, maybe I step on, on some. Okay, no, it's fine. Um, the goal was to push this distribution towards some independent Gaussian. And after you learn it, you will get an effective uh, energy in the latent space. Now imagine two kinds of update. So one is in the original physical space. Another one is the, um, you compose this function together with the transformation and do the updates. So in this case, hybrid and color, because it's all continuous variable. So in the latent space, so you see that in latent space, it summarizes much faster uh, than in the original space. But uh, of course, here the price to pay is uh, before you do any kind of Monte Carlo, there was like a training procedure. You need to take this energy and uh, train a network for some time, uh, so it unfolds the, the original manifold in, in, in the physical space. Then, then you can make it easier. 
and uh, um, so things. Uh, I think at this point it's also a, I think a nice uh, time to kind of uh, get some discussion about the different ways of accelerating Monte Carlo sampling using machine learning ideas. Because in the past few years, we already uh, saw several different classes of uh, examples. So this, this, this one, um, uh, people call it the self-learning Monte Carlo, and uh, in machine learning community, they just call it the surrogate function. So here the idea was, uh, imagine you had your uh, Hamiltonian, uh, like classical or quantum Monte Carlo Boltzmann weight, and uh, it's uh, hard to uh, compute them, or hard to compute the update rule. And um, um, you can set up a, a neural network, or whatever kind of a cheap function surrogate, and uh, do many steps of the update using your surrogate model, then propose that move from the surrogate or the reference system to the actual color system. So, you can also view this as a recommended engine because the recommended engine works almost in the same way because uh, you see you have some preference that is a distribution and Amazon will learn about your preference and build a model in their server. server. And, and uh, once you already, let's say, buy a lot of items or maybe sample a lot of by from your, your distribu preference distribution, Amazon will um, recommend a new item that is updated to you. You might accept or reject it, and then Amazon will tune his, their recommended model. So it works uh, in, in this way. So um, it's very natural you set up a probability model locally to, to do this. Um, but uh, this um, had a problem of so-called code start. Code start is a word also from recommend engine business. So imagine that uh, you are a new company where you have no data how should you set up, how do you recommend anything to, to others? Because here, it is assumed that uh, someone already did uh, some kind of Monte Carlo and give you data. So um, it, it then looks like a checking and egg problem. If there are no data, how should I start that? But of course, you can build up some um, adaptive, uh, adaptive approach, getting some data, recommend it back, and getting some data. That, that's definitely uh, a worth trying approach. Um, anyway, there's a second class uh, related to reinforcement uh, learning. So there was some attempt in machine learning also in Google. So uh, some other, that's uh, a paper from the University of Tokyo. That's an injurious uh, paper. So uh, here, the idea was trying to um, view Monte Carlo update as a policy using the language of uh, reinforcement learning because reinforcement learning is all about uh, interact. So some, 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 some agent that has certain building policy and it, it interacts with the environment and trying to optimize its policy to maximize the goal. So I think probably here the right goal was to uh, minimize the autocorrelation time, right? So then, then the thing is how should we write uh, autocorrelation time or related uh, quantity as the right reward and so on. So that's another interesting um, uh, way of using modern machine learning as a Monte Carlo accelerator. And what, what I was uh, telling you before uh, was another way, uh, using a so-called learned uh, representation, trying to do the update in another space. Of course, this uh, has long history. If you go back to Monte Carlo literature, there was already some Fourier space accelerated or maybe even wavelet Monte Carlo uh, attempts, and those by some uh, uh, molecular dynamics people were, because they also f uh, had a sampling problem, and they usually just uh, uh, unwrap, they, they just invent some function, uh, this G function, and <coughs> unwrap the original manifold and does that transformation in that space. So what the machine learning uh, and the deep neural network will bring to us is a trainable and a very flexible um, uh, transformation uh, for us. So um, that's uh, three directions uh, that I, I, I observed in the past few years. But uh, I think we still need to um, really push each of these directions to see um, more uh, physical results and uh, cons uh, constructive results.
And uh, um, I think let me, let me skip a few of the technical ones because the, for training of this, many of the generative models, there are uh, uh, two approaches that uh, you might look boring. So um, I told you two are kind of a, uh, secrets. And uh, for the last 15 minutes, uh, I will give you a <laughs> kind of bonus to that's another thing I find to be very useful. It, 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 it that did not fit these two, but uh, um, for me, those are really uh, cool things that we can learn from deep learning. It's called generative models. So what are generative models? Um, so to realize that, we, we need to distinguish between two kinds of learning, discriminative versus generative. So th this um, mathematical splitting is, is like a fitting of function, or maybe predict as so-called conditional distribution. So um, um, take an example, this is like uh, reading, reading a book or knowing the meaning of each of the character. But uh, even from our daily experience, we know that uh, uh, there's another level of learning. That's so-called generative learning. Uh, take an example, that's uh, about how to write a character on a paper. So my daily experience is telling me generative mo modeling is um, more difficult than this discriminative learning. Because many of the traditional Chinese characters I can read, but I cannot write on a paper. So mathematically, they correspond to model the joint distribution of data. And uh, I'm talking about to, to model them, to sample them, and so on. So um, Richard Freeman also told us, right? So um, I think in any kind of science, the ability to create indicates the highest level of understanding that's an example of generated art that was sold close to half a million. So if you look at the uh, signature of the artist, it's actually an <laughs> equation. So it's a loss function of the so-called generative adversary network. So th th this piece of the art was actually created by mapping Gaussian noise using a neural network directly to all those pixels. So that was about uh, uh, this kind of transformation. Right? We really view the um, paintings us as distribution from cert, uh, as samples from certain distribution and to capture those uh, uh, distribution using this uh, generative model. Uh, again, it has an uh, um, application in science. That was uh, related to something I already told you. But, but uh, basically, um, the, the, the idea of those generative models is to set up a neural network to do probability transformation. So we believe that in the latent space, all those attributes they are kind of uh, uh, factorized, independent, and global information. Uh, while in the physical configuration space, the species of the atom, the p p location of the atoms, they, ha they are correlated and they live on a manifold. And uh, generation is a procedure of mapping from simple to complex distributions. While on the reverse uh, direction, it's called a ref uh, inference. So you want to infer those uh, latent attributes from the microscopic detail. And why, why is uh, generative modeling difficult? That was uh, because the goal was to uh, uh, play around with this high dimensional probability distribution. How do we express those things? And how do we uh, learn this as a parameterized model? And even if we have it, have it how should we sample from those things? Those are all the diffi difficulties uh, in the generative modeling. And, uh, um, not surprisingly, you can already say it has close relation to f problems we had in physics. So uh, that's a quote from the book. Uh, they were saying that the images uh, encountered in the AI application <coughs> occupy a negligible proportions of the volume of images space because uh, uh, all those natural images they, they, they differ from all those random noise. They are physical. That's because uh, they had a certain intrinsic. Uh, um, uh, characteristics. The goal was to really uh, capture those uh, um, characteristics so you can sample and generate new imaging, um, new natural imaging uh, more easily. And uh, uh, let me skip this. Okay. Um, it, uh, yeah, let me skip it. So that, that actually a large family of uh, modern generation models. So Boltzmann machine was probably uh, 
the one we are mostly familiar with. So it, it, it's basically this setup. So to um, parameterize um, uh, high dimensional probability using energies and uh, uh, partition functions like, like, like that. So you might wonder, so if this looks like uh, just a simple rewriting, there's nothing to gain, right? Because uh, you, you just translate the, the problem of uh, parameterizing probability into the energy. But the good thing is that once you do that, you will um, have, a, 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 uh, have, have the ability to um, make a use of many of the tools developed by physicists. Because then you can talk about uh, um, how to uh, approximately compute the partition function. And uh, you can use the, the Monte Carlo technique to sample from such a uh, probability. You also got many of the uh, physical insight because once you write this, this probability of the data in, in, in terms of the energy, you, you, you can think about the energy of the data. Basically, that's a level likelihood. Energy is low or high, de uh, determines whether this is more probable or less, less, less uh, likely to happen. You can also talk about entropy and so on. So, those are kind of old contributions many years ago that the physicists made to this field. And uh, that was from us, but let me skip it. Uh, during recent years, there are many more other more generative models um, developed to tackle this problem. And uh, during the uh, seminar uh, talk, the model I was uh, using was so-called normalizing flow. And, uh, but I would also recommend some other models to you because, for example, these autoregressive flows, they are, they, are, they, are, they are also quite simple and interesting. Uh, I don't know whether we have enough time, but let, let's, let, let me introduce this to you very quickly uh, by, by playing a game with you. So we will, we will do a game. Uh, the game is called Guessing, guessing Word. So, so I had a word, English word, in, in mind, and uh, so so I will just uh, write a few boxes. So so you can just uh, guess whatever uh, characters, English character, and uh, if it's correct, I will put it in the box. Otherwise, I will just write uh, underneath it. Any guess for the first one? I. I. Not Huh? I. No. <laughs> First one. We can guess one at a time. It's B. B. No. A. No. W. W. No. C. No. M. Huh? M. M. No. C. B. No. O. No. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? You can use some strategy, right? What would be more frequent, the first character in English? T. No. <laughs> that's one. Yes. Yeah, that's it. Cool. That's more than for the next one. A. No. B. E. T. C. C. P. A. T. So this word has no vowels in it? It has a vowel. Definitely has it's a word. A. I over you. You in English, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Next one. Oh. oh. Yes. yes. Ah. So. Ah. Yeah. L. Yes. It has a meaning, or yeah, it has a meaning. Nothing. Oh. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Why? What, what did we learn from this, this game? You don't can, you can't 
Then summer first. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The first one. <laughs> so so so. <laughs> So, so this is uh, what the uh, probability. Uh, uh, so can you, sorry, can you tell us what the game was? I didn't quite understand. So, was the length of the word not fixed, or was it fixed in the beginning? Ah, the last of the last of the word is fixed. So, I, uh, once you guess all the characters correctly, I will stop the game. But and you have to guess them uh, character by character. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, Char character by character. So, so yeah. So, so, so. Uh, what this game was about is uh, imagine there was a uh, uh, like joint probability for all the possible <coughs> English words. So, um, so let me write it more carefully. It's like x one, x two. So each, each x is a uh, is a character. So what we were being doing here is uh, um, kind of parameterize this thing as a series of uh, conditional probabilities, so times p x three, x one comma x two, and so on. So basically, in in each of our mind, we had uh, this kind of probabilistic uh, model of the actual distribution, and uh, when we want to guess this word, essentially we're doing the sampling from this distribution. And uh, the first one is just a marginal, marginalized distribution of the first character in the English. That was from frequency count, right? But uh, th th then what's going on was uh, uh, for the next one, next one, as, lo as long as we had, as, as when we collect more information, um, each of those guys becomes uh, uh, simpler. And uh, so this is basically the way um, how if machine learning people parameterize high dimensional probabilities by writing them as a, a long chain of uh, conditional probabilities. Because for each conditional probability, uh, we are only predicting one character, so it's easy to normalize uh, with respect to that character. So uh, basically, I'm showing you uh, this, this, this family of models. So that's actually from DeepMind uh, for speech and for the imaging, and uh, it actually has the best performance among um, many of other models. Um, the, uh, with the pan, we were doing that, using that for some uh, stochastic uh, st 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 statistical mechanics calculations, rational ones, and uh, you can see some other applications to quantum state. So those, those are just one way of parameterizing high dimensional probabilities. You see what there is the advantage compared to um, the other models. For example, Boltzmann machines. Boltzmann machine is just the energy function that we do not know direct how to directly draw sample from. But this one, you can direct sample it. And uh, that's uh, one of the good things about it. But I guess, uh, let, me, let, me, let, me, yeah, let, me, let me let me stop here and see if there's a question about I have a question about the differential programming. Yes. Uh, is there any complete uh, proposal about uh, how to parameterize the space of uh, programs uh, which can be I mean, written by human beings? <laughs> You mean to parameterize those? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, actually, at least uh, you showed a kind of schematic picture of the space of programming, right? Space yeah. of program speed, space. Yeah. And uh, I actually, I was one, just wondering whether there is any complete uh, proposal for, I mean, actual I mean, parameterizing this, uh, this space. Uh, I think uh, <coughs> uh, there are some research related to those, uh, for example, uh, ID is auto completion of the programs, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, that's my guess because mm -hmm. that's something I'm not familiar with. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. yeah, actually, it reminds me of a so-called uh, generic uh, programming. Generic programming. Yeah, generic programming. But uh, as far as I know, it's kind of <laughs> difficult to get something really practical. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I just wonder whether there is some, any, any I mean, 
successful uh, applications of this kind of idea. So, because we are talking about it more or less this, this point, right? Yes. That, that is still like a uh, program written by human. So uh -huh. then, then, I think the recent progress that I'm aware of is along those uh, 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 deep uh, learning as an engine for an auto combination ideas, because uh -huh. you can write a, a few lines and uh -huh. uh, uh -huh. press tab, it automatically completes the whole thing. That, that is what I know well. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, in principle, this can be used uh, anything. I mean, for example, this can be used even for the code breaking, or for, for example. Yeah. But uh, I mean, usually such a tough problem cannot be solved uh, I mean, by using those yeah. things. In yeah. Yeah. But, but I would say those, um, th these things more like, it's more like a kind of propaganda or something. <laughs> so it's not a really serious. I show this just uh, to uh, I tell you the idea. Uh, yeah. I see. Yeah. Okay. I see. Yes. I have a question about all the regressive law because in the last last discount, for example. Yes. Uh, it seems like the order of the you know founders matters uh, right. to to performance, right? Yes. So how do you determine the order of your founders? So the um, so that's uh, a very good question, actually. Um, that's uh, another also kind of limiting uh, case of uh, those auto, auto regression models because for one dimensional things like speech that data, where there is already other kind, it's <coughs> very, very nice. But uh, for two dimensional things, uh, essentially what DeepMind was doing is, is, is just uh, this order. This is like applying matrix products data to 2D systems. So the order is like that. Maybe it makes no sense, but still it works. Yeah, Because the, the model has a large enough capacity, so in the end, they just order it in, in this way. So this pixel depends on the pixels in, uh, before it. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm, there, there, there should be some uh, optimum ordering uh, to, 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 to different data, I think. Is such a C4 in sequence should be valid also for physical problems? That's actually what we did for IC model. Even for two-dimensional IC model, we just uh, impose this uh, snake or maybe zigzag order. And uh, um, because, you see, um, th this is kind of onset. So, um, it, it, for whatever um, probability, you can always impose this answer. So, this, as long as for each of the factor is uh, expressive enough, it can still reproduce uh, the joint distribution. But uh, it's only uh, that uh, um, this uh, is not so natural for two-dimensional problems. But anyway, we 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 will still apply it to to the IT model. Uh, got uh, Nice rational energy and so on. Yeah. But, but that, that's another point. So actually, um, in the paper we had uh, some other problems for uh, SK spin glass where they had out wall. So in that case, uh, the, the, the lattice is not so important. I think that's another use of case of this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You just mentioned spin glass. So actually, I was wondering what happens if you apply this in Monte Carlo something for the I mean, descent down to the network, neural network, or, I mean, what, what was that? Latent space. Latent space, yeah. yeah. Latent. <laughs> I, I wonder what would happen if you apply I mean, that kind of uh, Monte Carlo something to really hard problem like uh, spin glass systems for 3D, or maybe sharing the hard public model, as you mm -hmm. just mentioned. Yeah, so in, in this case, uh, that, that was then related to uh, the way of training it. Actually, we apply that to many of several of those uh, challenging, frustrating spin models. Typically, we are going to see this. So, imagine for those problems, there are different modes, modes in the space mm -hmm. that is uh, kind of disconnected and so on. And uh, then the training procedure. So, so my 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 uh, neural network model usually will only capture one of the modes. It will miss another mode, mm -hmm. and this corresponds to a uh, local minimum mm -hmm. in the objective function because the objective function was lower bounded by the free energy. Mm -hmm. 
So the, diff the lesson is the difficult things still manifest themselves mm -hmm. in the training procedure. Mm -hmm. So you are so so for for frustrated man and so on, this will happen. And uh, I see. Now, now the thing is how how how, how to solve this optimization problem. Uh -huh. And did, did you ever observe the, the um, qualitative difference between 2D case and 3D case? I mean, 2D case is a, not MPR, right? It's yeah. easy, right? Mm -hmm. 3D case is hard. So, I mean, I, I wonder if we, yeah. I mean, we, we haven't applied that to 3D case. Oh, I see. Yeah. I see. Only played with 1D, 2D different uh, methods, and uh, uh, Shannon can uh, that model, SK model. I see. But SK model is hard, right? It's hard. Maybe there is. Maybe we, we, already, we already saw this oh, kind yeah, of thing yeah, in, for SK model. Not, so not for 2D years. Not for 2D years. For, oh, for SK model. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Sampling difficulty becomes an uh, organization difficulty. <coughs> I see. Question about the design tangle, the role of design tangle. Yeah. Network. So, is there any uh, discussion about the informational aspect of design tangle in the context of uh, machine learning? Uh, yes. So, yeah, it's so right. So, so because it's like analog of this with respect to mirror, right? Because mirror people care about the um, entanglement entropy and so on. So here, the uh, important quantity is uh, mutual information, mm -hmm. and uh, since the uh, invertible transformation, uh, they respect the mutual information. So uh, for many of those disentanglers, what uh, uh, you can show was uh, how how are they removing the mutual information between left and right. So uh, there there are definitely discussions about uh, the flow of mutual information in a network. In particular, those kind of invertible network because it's more uh, accessible mm -hmm. uh, for information theoretical uh, study. Yeah. Um, question. So, in, in this uh, graph, you have uh, each primitive, you have the uh, activation function. So, what, what is the inside? You mean? No, no, but the, yeah, inside you have activation functions. Inside we had uh, we had what what was called the uh, real NVP net, mm -hmm. and uh, so it, it has a uh, several layers of real okay. MVP. Yeah. And uh, I have a question about the optimization scheme. Yes. Uh, does, the, does the optimization scheme take care about the, such a reduce of mutual information? The, the optimization scheme we had at, at the moment was, you can imagine that the, for whatever action here, we just do transformation to the latent space and the, the, ob the objectivity was uh, to compare this effective theory against a certain Ga a Gaussian, mm -hmm. and we want to re bring those two distributions closer. Mm -hmm. That was the objective function. And in that sense, you can uh, view uh, this objective function uh, as trying to remove all those uh, um, mutual information between these variables. Mm -hmm. So you, you, can, you can bring that uh, uh, KR divergence in the latent space uh, into a mutual information penalty. But that, that was explained in the supplementary here. Mm, but uh, it's similar to the optimization scheme for MERA. We, at first, we assume this uh, tensor play a role of uh, the same time. Right? However, we only just optimize the uh, total energy or variational energy. Right. So, it, yeah, of course, maybe the, this, this tensor uh, should play a role of the same time, right? it's, it's better, but uh, in fact, uh, there are many local minima, so mm -hmm. totally we, we hope the role of the same time right, should be become uh, more better and better, but uh, in, in some optimization schemes, so the, such a global goal can, cannot be Right, or oh, I see. So, so yeah. So, so in, in this case, the, the 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 goal of this KR divergence was also related to minimizing the variational free energy. And, and the thing you were suggesting is, is that 
related to the fact that uh, um, optimizing the energy or free energy maybe it's a different thing from uh, reducing the uh, mutual information. Is that what uh, you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, uh, reducing of mutual information is a better way on the purpose. Yeah, this network. But uh, I wonder the your optimization scheme uh, keep the such a correct way always in, even in local uh, <coughs> new running over parameter in local neural network each box. Then I don't think so mm -hmm. because uh, there is only one overall um, objective function that is. Uh, uh, let all those things to become Gaussian. Mm -hmm. But you can see that uh, if uh, I uh, reach that goal, um, meaning I can try to close the rational gap, they, they, all the things become uh, uh, independent. However, this does not mean that at each step I'm imposing this uh, local uh, disentangler mm -hmm. kind of picture, because that, that's, uh, that's not, uh, uh, not the same thing. Mm -hmm. Um, can you comment on if there are any like progress in terms of uh, 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 applying, say, some global symmetries to this uh, neural network? You mean here, applying yeah. global oh. symmetry? Yeah. Ah, okay. So, so we tried Z2 and U1 symmetries, okay. and uh, the Z2 one was like very simple because we just had two copies of them and uh, like mix. Okay. It becomes a mixture model, <coughs> and the U1 U1 symmetry was implemented here. Then, then that was more of like a bottom-up approach. So in each block, because it's, it's in line, it's like a group. So if you ensure each block uh, respect to U1, then mm -hmm. you stack them together, it's also U1. Mm -hmm. that, that, that was explored here for x y model. Because uh, in the physics, there's uh, some not only global symmetry, you can have like point group symmetries and oh, point like fermions, for example. Ah, oh, oh, okay. Oh, fine. Uh, so, so symmetry. So, so um, we had some other stuff. I think I, I completely omitted them. Um, so, so let me just very uh, briefly give you the idea. So, um, that was related to this, this, these guys. Um, mm -hmm. So um, yeah, so so because um, many of those flow model, they had a continuous time limit. Because if, if you say if you if I do that step by step, mm -hmm. then in <coughs> general, um, I, 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 then I do not have a general framework uh, that allows me to put in many of the symmetries. Um, Why, on the other hand, if if I go to continuous time. Because this flow model, like neural ODE, also has a continuous time version. In the continuous time version, then, then there is a way to put many of the symmetries. So, so we, we, we did it uh, somewhere here. Um, because uh, um, in the continuous time version, um, you induce the transformation using a generating function. And the generating function is a scalar function. And, and for that scalar function, it's easy to um, design many of the symmetries. And, and then, the, then the, 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 the derivative of the generating function will induce the flow. And the flow will also be symmetric. So at least to me, that's the one uh, of the general framework to impose symmetry to those uh, transformations. So, so through the generating function, you can use time. Yeah, I think I had one example here. Um, Responding from physical because that, that all was also a problem for us. How do you make sure that uh, the generated uh, configurations they uh, respect all the physical symmetries? Right. Sometimes it, it, it always like spin up, is dominant and so on. But, uh, but, uh, I think there is a way. But, uh, might be other ways. We can talk. Definitely.